So much of the score of uh, Beckett uh, is informed by Gregorian chant, which was really the principal music, uh, other than ordinary folk music or street music, uh, of the music of the church, of course, was the music. And so uh, I decided to open the film with one of the most famous examples of Gregorian chant, the uh, Veni Sancti Spiritus, which goes... Uh, uh, And then immediately uh, uh, the full orchestra comes in with something which is not at all to do with the 12th century, which is... I did a couple of films in Hollywood, a film called A Raisin in the Sun, and then another one in New York called The Miracle Worker. And then suddenly Peter Glenville rang me up and told me that he was going to do uh, a stage version of Beckett, the great play by Jean Anouilh, starring Laurence Olivier and Anthony Quinn. And he would like me to compose incidental music for the play, which I did play was very successful, uh, and the music was a very simple kind of a score. In the theater, it's not nearly as elaborate as a film score, you know. It, you, you, compose, um, you compose music for, for scene changes and transitions, and sometimes for a certain atmosphere. But I was dealing now with 12th century England, and I was beginning to get the feel of it, and uh, the score was composed for about nine instruments, mostly brass. Very soon after the play opened, Peter rang me up and said, we're going to make a film of Beckett, and uh, we're going to do it in England, and I'd like you to do the score. Well, I, I was thrilled. I mean, it was a wonderful opportunity. But I hadn't um, counted on one element, and that was the producer of the film, Hal Wallace, who had done many great films in his life. He was very unhappy about Peter's choice of me as a composer. The principal reason was that he'd never heard of me. Somehow, Peter was able to persuade him. Uh, I don't know how he did it, but soon uh, I found myself with a contract, and uh, they were very soon going into production. And um, Peter said, you know, I'd like you to come to London a little bit before you actually begin work. I'd like you to be there for two or three weeks to be at the shooting and really absorb the atmosphere. So this was very exciting to me. I was still very young. I was relatively inexperienced. But I went, and there was this phalanx of great English actors, not only Peter O'Toole and Richard Burton, but the celebrated John Gielgud, Gielgud playing the King of France, and Felix Aylmer playing the Archbishop of Canterbury, Donald Wolfett playing the Bishop of London. These were very great actors. And suddenly I was thrown into this atmosphere. Sean Phillips, who was then Peter O'Toole's wife, who was playing Gwendolyn, taught me uh, a number of very beautiful Welsh folk songs, and one of them actually became her theme in the film. Uh, it goes...
She actually performs that song and sings it on the uh, on her lute. John Bryan, one of the supreme art directors, had created this whole medieval village and he had created the interior inside an airplane hangar on the set of Shepperton Studios. He had created Canterbury Cathedral, the scene of Thomas Beckett's uh, assassination, the famous murder in the cathedral. So uh, I walked around this, these sets, sat in on a lot of the uh, shooting. Peter O'Toole was always charming and great, and we met later on Man of La Mancha and became good friends. But uh, Richard Burton was difficult because he had to sing Gregorian chant as the Archbishop of Canterbury, and it was my job to teach him how to do it. This was all before I even began working on the score. This was during these three weeks because at the time of his murder, he was singing vespers in the cathedral and he had to sing. Deus in adjutorium meum intende. Richard Burton was one of these people whom you really can't teach anything. I mean, he, he was wonderful, a dazzling actor, but he had this characteristic that you, you can't teach him anything. You can only remind him of something that he already knows. And uh, he didn't know how to sing Gregorian chant, but he made a good effort at it. And Elizabeth Taylor was sitting around all the time trying to say, oh, Dickie, it's time for lunch. And so we, we, we had, our, we, we, we had our, our difficulties, but he was basically cooperative. The work on the score uh, was a far cry from my little score for the Broadway production. The canvas was huge, whereas before it had been like a little pencil sketch or a watercolor. Now this was a tapestry of music. Principally, what I had to do, I felt, was to evoke that period of late medieval music. And suddenly I realized that I wasn't interested in, uh, in making some kind of an accurate reproduction of that music. This was not a, 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 a historical study, it was an entertainment. What I did feel, it was important to evoke, even inaccurately, uh, the general feeling of the music of that period. Uh, which had just begun to emerge out of Gregorian chant with different voices, more uh, a polyphonic kind of, of comp composition. And so uh, I did use a great deal of Gregorian chant because that was part of the film, but also I used certain kinds of triadic uh, parallelism, which, which was also uh, characteristic, a form called organum. For example, I took this fragment of Gregorian chant. And harmonized it with all parallel triads, so it came out. Some of the music is not that at all. Some of the music is totally 20th century. The wonderful thing is, as you you know, the uh, Nui play is um, is has a kind of modern feel about it. At one point, uh, the king says, "Oh, here comes our snack." You know, it it it's full of sort of modern little colors and and attitudes, and at the same time, it's quite faithful to the essence of the story. 
I remember having a, a conversation with Margaret Furse, who, who designed the costumes for the film. And uh, we were talking about this very subject. And she said, oh, for heaven's sake, Larry, you know, at the time this story took place, the dresses that the women were wearing were hideously ugly. But about 75 years later, they became totally beautiful. So <laughs> we moved it. And I thought, this is really artistic license. Why not? I mean, we are not trying to present a textbook of style in the 12th century. This is a film. This is a work of art. So uh, I felt pretty much the same way with the music. It's not all by any means accurate, but it evokes the era. By now, the film had finished shooting, and I was hard at work composing the score. There was one thing about working with Peter Glenville which I really loved about him, and it's not true of all directors, either theater or film directors, many of whom are what we call self-styled musical experts and begin to tell you what you ought to compose and what instruments you ought to use and all of that. Peter never did that, but Peter was interested in what is going to be the effect of the music. What is it there for? What emotional or atmospheric effect is it designed to produce? And he would never discuss the means. He would always leave that completely in my hands. I knew that there were certain scenes in the play of such dramatic intensity that no music of the 12th century that I knew uh, could even remotely cover the dramatic exigencies of that particular scene. So I really feel that the, that the score came of its own. It's amazing how when you begin to compose, the notes themselves, the tones themselves, begin to have a certain will. They seem to almost begin to acquire their own uh, power of movement, and the composer isn't really necessarily entirely in charge, because the notes already have a certain force. The way they've been put together, they must go in a certain direction. And that's what I felt a lot during the composing of Beckett. I truly thought, um, in terms of what the film needed and where the music wanted to go. And um, the, the instinct is better and truer and more trustworthy than any kind of uh, intellectual calculation. I worked entirely at the studio. Actually, I worked in Peter O'Toole's dressing room. He had, had a wonderful suite and of course he'd gone. So they simply moved a wonderful Beckstein into the suite and um, a, a big work table, and uh, I worked there. And it was good to be very near where Ann Coates was cutting the film, because if I needed to suddenly remind myself of exactly how a certain scene looks, it's not just the action, you know? Sometimes you see a scene and it depends how much sky is showing in the shot. How much sky is showing may influence what your orchestration will be at that moment. You never know. So I was able to be close to where the film was being cut, and if I wanted to go down, I could ask Anne to run a certain sequence for me. Then I'd come back to the piano. Shortly before uh, I began working on this film, uh, as a Christmas present to my wife, I had set a poem by, uh, by James Joyce to music. It was called Bright Caps and Streamers, and it was all about the joy of youth and the exuberance of, uh, of friendship and love. And, and uh, suddenly when I saw these, this shot of Richard Burton and Peter O'Toole 
racing, racing across the fields, both riding on the same horse after having spent the night with the same girl. It suddenly brought this song to mind and produced the theme which became their theme for the entire film. And so the theme, which is... I was really grateful to have written that song because it, it gave me this theme. We had one interesting experience. Um, there was so much Gregorian chant in the film that we had to find a place to record it. And uh, the chap who was the set dresser was a devout Catholic and he knew about uh, a seminary in Hertfordshire, just north of London, where they specialized in Gregorian chant. And uh, so we went up there one morning with a sound truck and uh, they got all the seminarians together. They were all boys in their late teens and early 20s, and they sang like gods. They were absolutely wonderful. They had the right essential feeling about Gregorian chant because there is not one ounce of feeling of soloism. When you're singing Gregorian chant, you are part of the group and, and what you feel in their singing is a total absence of ego, which you would not hear in an opera chorus where everyone is singing from his most extravagant place. But these young men, even singing for a film, it was a sacred service for them, and they were devoted to the chant, and they sang it very beautifully. I was already at the piano, uh, working away, when suddenly, at about 8 o'clock in the morning, the telephone rings. And I pick up the phone. I couldn't imagine it would be ringing me at that hour, and suddenly I hear, Lawrence? Yes? It's Mr. Wallace. Oh, God. What's this about? He said, I've heard some disturbing rumors. He had this, this very Midwestern sort of twangy voice. And he said, I understand that uh, you are planning to end this film on a very uh, morbid and ironic note. And I'm just here to tell you that that's not my idea at all. He said, I feel that the king has, as he put it, benefited from the Beckett experience, and he has now become a better and deeper man and the music should end triumphantly. Well, I was, I was rather stunned. For one thing, I was wondering, does this man have any idea of what this film is about? <laughs> and, uh, but I said, well, uh, what could I say? Here I was, a young fledgling composer who had only got the job by the grace of God and Peter Glenville's kind insistence. Uh, and um, I said to him, uh, uh, well, Mr. Wallace, that's very interesting, and I certainly will keep, that, keep your opinion in mind as I compose. And I hung up. I was shaking. I had never been uh, dealt with that way by a film producer. And uh, I didn't know. I wasn't planning to end the film exactly on a morbid note. But here is this massive hypocrisy taking place of a king who has engineered Beckett's death, making public penance to the crowd and telling them that he, that he has regretted this and that he uh, has proposed to the, to the Pope that Thomas Beckett be made a saint and all of that. I thought, you can't just sort of wash over that with a lot of glorious trumpets. Thomas Beckett! former Archbishop of Canterbury, a martyr to the cause of God and his church, shall henceforth be honored and prayed to in this kingdom as a saint. So I sat there stunned. But then um, I started really thinking, you know, Hal Wallace has made a lot of successful films. 
And maybe before completely dismissing his idea, I should just think about it for the moment. And I began to think and think and think, and sudden, suddenly something began to emerge from the whole way uh, of dealing with the end. That it really could be even a greater irony if against an apparent triumphant finale, there could be certain really ironic notes which would tell the audience that all was not really well, that it only appeared to be well. And I thought, if I can accomplish that, it might work. And I began working immediately on that finale and found a way of adding a few not very dissonant, but to a certain extent dissonant, intruding notes coming into the score in the trombones at the very end. What I did was to simply add two trombones playing on the seventh note of this harmony, which produced this effect. simply not a completely joyous conclusion, not a completely triumphant conclusion, but one which leaves a certain quality of questioning. <laughs> And I thought, nobody except a person of real musical acumen will be able to recognize what's going on here. They may feel it in their gut, but they won't know what it is. And uh, uh, I think that Mr. Wallace will be okay. And uh, the amazing thing is that the first time he came onto the recording stage, we were recording that finale and I was standing absolutely terrified looking at him out of the corner of my eye. Muir Matherson was out there conducting the orchestra and there came this finale. And gradually, a great smile of relief came over his face. And he walked over to me and clapped me on the shoulder and said, well, you did it, my boy, you did it. So <laughs> we had it both ways. Anyway, that was perhaps my most dramatic event in the entire composition of the score. When I did Beckett, I was told that because of some kind of an international regulation, they required that the conductor be British. Well, I wasn't especially upset by that, but I said, look, if I need to have a, a, an English conductor, I want it to be Muir Matheson, because he is, he is the best. He conducted all the great William Walton scores, and all those Shakespearean scores, and uh, they said yes, they could arrange that, and in fact, they got him and his Symphonia Orchestra to conduct the score. Well, I can't say enough about Muir Matheson. He was absolutely superb. He was wonderful, he was kind, he was helpful. He, he absorbed the score very quickly, and he conducted it absolutely to perfection. And uh, even with much less cueing uh, than is done today, he was able to hit the correct cues on the screen. Mar was, that was his, his specialty. He was, he was really wonderful. I remember one day when, when we uh, uh, had done a cue and broke, we were about to break for lunch and without having finished recording it. And uh, I was very glad we hadn't recorded. And uh, he came down and I said, Muir, there are these two bars that I have really done something wrong. Somehow the bottom drops out of the orchestra and I don't understand why. It shouldn't, it looks right on the page, but there's something wrong. And I, I really was upset because it was an important moment for the f in the film. And uh, I, I felt that I had ruined a great moment. 
And he said, well, well, he said, don't, don't worry about that. Just, uh, why don't you just bring the score along to lunch? We'll have lunch and then we'll sort it out. That wonderful, comforting English expression of sorting it out. You just feel that everything will be all right once Muir Matheson sorts it out. So we had our lunch and he had his little whiskey or something, whatever it was. I was a little worried about that, but he seemed to be not at all affected by it. And he said, okay, now let's have a look. And he got the score out and he looked at those two bars. And he said, yes, yes, I can see that. Well, he got his pencil out, put a little, maybe a little bass clarinet to support the cellos here. And maybe, maybe you could hold the horns a few more. Da -da, da -da, da -da, fix, fix, fix. There, done. So I, I looked at it and I couldn't believe it. And I said, I, I trust you. I, I, I would never have guessed to do those things. We went back into the studio after lunch, played that moment, and it was perfection. I had written a part for oboe d'amore, which is an early form of the oboe, and uh, I got no less than the celebrated Leon Goosens, who played first oboe in this orchestra, to play the oboe d'amore part. And when you hear it in the score, it is it's absolutely gorgeous. So I felt that I was in an unbelievably blessed situation in my relatively young life as a film composer to be surrounded by, by uh, artists uh, and craftsmen of such uh, high quality. The film came out um, and uh, I was uh, very honored to be uh, nominated for an Academy Award, but when it came time for the actual choice of the winners, there was a very popular picture that came out that year, which was about as far from Beckett as anything you could possibly imagine. It was Mary Poppins. And everybody adored Mary Poppins and Chim Chim Churi and all those wonderful songs. One walked away with the Oscar. It's okay. It's um, I'm I um, joined a, a, a very distinguished crowd of non-winning nominees, so I wasn't really offended. When it was decided to uh, to restore the film to its original glory, and even better than than some of the versions which have been seen on screens. Uh, this was really a very exciting prospect. And uh, I saw the, the film when it was first uh, shown after its restoration. And it was wonderful. But I must say that this DVD uh, is superior to anything I have ever seen, both in the quality of the color, of the precision, the sharpness of the definition, and the clarity of the soundtrack. Uh, it's really superb. So, uh, so Beckett, in a certain way, has a, a new life. So obviously that is very, a very great pleasure to me to see that.